Producer dude, here we are again. I have no idea how many podcasts we've done, but it feels like sometimes like three and sometimes it feels like a million. Where were we? We're in the 60s. 60s. Ooh. Think of that. You've you've spent like more than a week nonstop with me. Yeah, well, let's see. Let's let's do the math. Let's figure we did 60 podcasts at an average of an hour. Okay. So that's almost three full days. But then on top of it, I got three hours of editing and looking at your face on top of it for all 60. So now I'm looking at 240. So that's 10 full days. That's just a perk of the job, big daddy. Of, of looking at your mug. That's just a perk of the job. All that. Look, how about anybody, you know, getting a little advantage of watching the YouTube? They're like, because people always ask me, should I download this on Spotify? I say, I don't care what you were, you downloaded, but I think they should watch the YouTube because you would get to see my most incredible raccoon. What would you call this? I mean, the sunglass line. Reverse so, raccoon. Reverse raccoon. Reverse raccoon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody called me the, the, what did they call me? Like an Oreo face or something the other day? <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, might have that been mean. unrelated totally. I don't even know. Yeah. But we have an interesting guest. We've got a guy who I've known for quite a while. His dad's actually a guide client, um, and he's very fishy. He's worked for a bunch of fishing organizations through the years, and he is with Rapala, basically a um, – He's, I think, product manager technically is is the job description producer dude. But basically what he does is I work with him on developing new lures. Like, what a cool job. I don't think that was at uh, um, the vocational school. I didn't see that title on there. No, I have not seen that. Um, yeah. My okay. biggest question is, is it Rapala or Rapala? I was thinking of this even before we signed on here. That... That's my question for the entire podcast. That's what I want to know. We are going to get that answer because you are, even as a uh, self-proclaimed non-fisherman, yes. you know the right questions to ask. That's why your your journalistic background comes in here. <laughs> but it is a, it's a rampant question amongst the fishing community as well. But I got to be honest, we are going to get way deeper than that. We are actually going to talk about baits. We're going to release this podcast maybe a little out of sync that we would normally do, right? Because we are going to talk about the baits that we've been working on for, you know, over, you know, some guys for much longer than myself um, that are just being re- re- uh, released here at iCast. I can't even say it because I'm so excited, but a bunch of new baits that have been already winning tournaments by the pro staff guys. And we'll, we're going to talk about how these get developed, the process, what Finland does, um, you know, VMC, how custom hooks are made for this. It's, it's, it's really interesting stuff. And I know like you're not a fisherman. We joke about that, but you're always interested with this behind the scenes and how it works. Like there's even a show, right? Like how it works. And that's kind of what this is. Yeah. So, uh, so let's get to it. Let's bring Kyle Wood on. Did, can I just, you know, because how me and you are, can I just jump right in? Just you can do it. Yeah, home. you can do it. You're my third favorite wood. <laughs> I figured. I figured and, you're going to say that. And if I say, if I was to figure wood in like oak or like maple or something, you'd be like eight or nine. But uh, forest wood, number one. Obviously. Uh, duh. Jim Wood, number two, a.k.a. your father. The one man, of my yep. favorites yep. to fish with. And then there's Kyle Wood, if we're not figuring in like alabaster, um, maple, um, I don't, any, any wood basically. Dude, I'll take a top five and a top 10 all day, all day. Man, maybe not so much on the top 10 thing at the end there, but at any rate, in all seriousness, you know, the fishing industry has a weird way of circling back. You know, we've had, I used to work with my buddy, Kurt Niedemeyer and, uh, you know, now you're with Rapala and it just kind of seems like a natural fit. I know everybody's there, but, um, Mm -hmm. would you call this like your dream position? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And the thing is, is you know, it's just I've worked with a lot of companies through the years, and some of them are um, better than others with behind the scenes stuff. How about sure. that? But I mean, the one thing there is, is you know, most of the dudes are pretty fishy, right? Like yes. the people that I, at least that I deal with, which is you know, quite a few of you. And I think that the the one thing is, is like that I've kind of seen is you guys, even though like Rapala is a huge company, but. I mean, at least in my mind, it is from a fishing standpoint. Yep. But you guys wear a lot of different hats. And so even though your title may be one thing, like the thing we're going to talk about, which I'm excited, is new stuff. Because product development, like even, I mean, there's there's a lot of different guys there we deal with and do things. But, I mean, you are you help bring things to concept. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Nail on the head. 
For sure. So, so tell me, get, give me a little bit about, you know, some of some of the things here. Like, I mean, when you take a lure from concept to finish, mm-hmm. I don't think people really understand. You know, I mean, I I work with like a spoon company, like a trolling spoon company, a little Silver Street, and just and that's like intimate because that's a small company, especially compared right. to what you guys are. And seeing what stages we have to go through for something that is relatively simple because like spoons haven't changed a whole lot like the lure jensen lineup of spoons i mean yeah you could argue that maybe but i, I not much right no and so no. but yet seeing i mean like we worked on a spoon a number of years ago that was an ice spoon and how many takes and remoldings and things we had to do in order to get them you know to work throughout and we had like couple sizes working good but then these other couple sizes weren't as we scaled and just these things that i don't think people really appreciate you know, mm-hmm. from A to Z, or, or they even understand that there is an A to Z. And so maybe help us out with kind of how that, you know, concept to finish, how that actually works. I mean, dude, I, I was fascinated as we were just talking about this driving home from work there a few days ago, you know, some of the stuff like the shop over there, I'm not going to steal your thunder, but sure. You, d- dig in. Dig so, in. yeah, it's kind of, um, you know, with, with Rapala originating in Finland, um, we still have a very large presence of our product development that occurs over there. Um, even though, you know, we'll have us products and, and it's something that we work on, uh, or, or, you know, it came up with the concept for, um, we still ultimately go back through Finland because they've over the years perfected the way to, to make lures, whether it's balsa or, um, uh, you know, in a plastic body. So usually it'll start with some sort of, um, you know, uh, sketch, draw. Uh, we have a couple engineers in house um, here in our Rapalos office. I guess I should probably lead off for those that don't know. Our U.S. office is in Minnetonka, Minnesota, so that's where I'm sitting currently. Um, so we have a designer in here. He may j- draw something up. We'll approve it. We will send that CAD drawing to Finland uh, to look at, or um, you know, it may be a phone call just with a couple of their designers in Finland in which they'll draw something up. Maybe we send them a a rough sample of something that was uh, carved here or 3d print is also a really good way to get the ball moving at least um, early on. And we utilize that throughout the process, but yeah, once, once you have that thought um, it kind of then translates to, well, okay, obviously we got to get something in hand and a 3d print, like I just said, is usually the way to at least get the idea of, yeah, that's the size we're looking for. That's the width we're looking for. Um, nowadays, you know, 3D printers are so good. You can 3D print basically a prototype, uh, you know, put weights in it and run it and see how roughly the action is going to be. It's not going to be exact. If you're if you're doing a 3D print for Balsa, right, it's not going to translate over. Um, but that kind of at least gets things going. And then you move on to proto tooling. And well, uh, let me stop you right there. So here's yeah. a question already that I think it's the elephant in the yeah. room. 3D printing is not new, but yet, you know, whether it's cost or accuracy or materials or all of the above, like how long have you guys been doing 3D printing? Uh, I'd say it's been, I don't know, five years, probably six years. And how much do you think that with what stuff that we're currently going to talk about here, Mm -hmm. how much do you think that that has shortened the curve if we didn't have this 3D printing because again, like I don't think people realize. Again, I'm not trying to steal your thunder here, but no. like how many times, or just lures that don't come out because they suck, right? right. Or right. or how little of a difference. That's why I hope we can stress to the people: is these these changes that are so minute that make a lure slam them, catch fish, like all get out, or absolutely like this thing sucks. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it hands down has been a giant uh, thing to help us overcome um, all kinds of stuff. But like I said, it's it, that early on in the process when you're really trying to get a bait in hand and, and see how it works and at least get the action sort of right, because you got to go to prototype tooling where you're actually say it's balsa, where you're actually lathing that bait, carving it out. Or if it's, uh, if it's plastic where you're going to an actual ABS or, or whatever material you're using, uh, cause you'll see differences, but it, it has shortened it immensely because before it would be like, you got to spend money on tooling up, um, you know, the plastic mold for it, right? There's money there. And then if you, if you missed it, 
instead of whatever hundred, couple hundred dollars in material, right, to 3D print something, you're looking at, you know, thousands of dollars well, that you just threw in the garbage and you got to repeat it five, 10, 15, 20 times in the process, right? Well, I mean, fun fact right now, another manufacturer I work with, it's not lures or anything, but we're working on a sweet new project. And it's one of those, we knew we were going to have to do five, six, seven, eight, nine times yep. to get this right. And the first one was sent out and it was three grand for this deal. And it was like one of those, you're like, uh Oh, because it was, it was like, a penny you know what i mean as far as right. how, what we knew and now we're doing it, it in house with this company on an 800 3d printer so yeah. it's like 800 for the whole printer about 20 dollars worth of materials you know to to do this and then the big advantage is that then we can have three or four so you can hand them out to three or four rosses or jacob wheelers or whoever yeah. it is so you're getting more you know it just it shortens that curve as far as figuring it out as well for sure with, with, with the cost so it's it's kind of see it's, it's neat to see that kind of work through. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, to your point, um, and kind of getting back to the whole process, right? So once we, uh, say it's a, whatever, uh, the new jerk bait, right. Our new Maverick jerk bait, uh, that we have out, well, we can, we can get 3d prints of those, uh, quickly. Most of that we deal with Finland because they'll assemble everything they have. Uh, not that we don't hear, but you know, they're, the designers working on it over there can basically make them fishable uh, real quick. And at the same time, because they're eight hours ahead, you know, I can fish something today, send them a note, and they can basically 3D print something tomorrow morning in a few hours and put it back in the mail and get us new samples uh, in a pretty quick turnaround, um, which is awesome. Because like you said, it, the cost savings there, but also just the ability, whether it's a computer file change, like something we do here and, and, and send to them, or just a phone call or an email, um, a message on Teams, whatever it is. That's kind of the, I guess, maybe the weirdest part for us is how much, you know, we, Finland works, we work with Finland uh, and that time zone difference. So you always kind of got to think like, well, it's whatever, four o'clock now, central time. So eight hours, yeah. midnight. It's yeah. Sunday there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. I send them an email. They'll look at it bright and early tomorrow when they wake up, uh, which means I usually get a response while I'm sleeping. And as long as you're ahead of it, you can keep the ball going. And uh, But, yeah, uh, from 3D prints, you got to make the move to whatever material you're doing, whether it's uh, plastic, balsa. Um, you got to look at that lure in that material it's ultimately going to be made out of. And then that's kind of where the process gets – Usually you're you're pretty close, I would say, uh, on size you're looking for. Dive depth is usually something that's got to vary, but that's relatively easy to adjust uh, in in the scheme of a project. And then it's kind of like little minor tweaks from there. And go back to uh, you know our new PXR Maverick jerkbait. We had we were running prototype samples, which is our, our prototype tooling of it. For um, I mean, it was probably six months, seven months, uh, where we were just looking at adjusting the action a little bit. And we were also looking at maximizing that diving depth. So it'll dive six feet, uh, you know, virtually on every cast on 10 pound floor, 12 pound floor. Um, that took a little bit, but those were really small tweaks that we could make without changing the body. You know what I mean? Like it's a different position of the bill, it's a line tie difference, you know, little modifications that are easy to do on our end without having to send something back to Finland. But it, and now on, on some of those modifications, is that from angler feedback? Some of it, some of it was uh, like me and Dan Quinn just in the boat playing around, adding suspend strips, uh, sanding the bill down a little bit, taking a pliers and tweaking the line tie, um, those kinds of things. But yeah, a lot of it too, because that project as a whole was, uh, you know, we the, for the most part, our, our Bass Pro staff was involved kind of throughout the whole deal. So, yeah, send them out, get a few things from those guys, and then we try it, right? Whatever tweak Patrick Walters did or whatever, you know, Seth might have done, Wheeler, uh, you know, Swindle, who, you name it, whoever was messing with it, then we'd look at it and then we'd relay that back to Finland who could make that adjustment on a bigger scale, right, to get us multiple baits back here, uh, to then play around with that next version. I don't think people realize how long this takes because of these tweaks or mm -hmm. 
I mean, you know, sometimes you don't even know what you're looking for, you know, and especially when it's a newer style bait, you know, yeah. I don't, uh, I, I'm always fascinated. That's the behind, behind the scenes stuff that I think people are interested in is because, again, you don't know if you don't know, right? right. And, right. and again, certain jerk baits, I mean, I think like, I don't know, I mean, it's not a secret. There's a handful of different jerk baits that guys use, even though they're not paid to use them. Yep. And and sometimes, of course, you're trying to get away from that and make something better, which is what Rappel has done, you know, whether it's a lipless bait or or just about anything. But I mean, what's what's some of the longest processes? Because I know when I came on with you guys, there was obviously intentions on doing some maybe not bass stuff. Right. Because that's not what that's not. Maybe you're, not you're good at bass. catching not bass, We're not bass, yeah. because anybody can catch bass. Why would I want to do that? That's yeah. Really a piece of cake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, and I know that you know some of the behind the scenes guys, they were like, whoa, slow your roll, big daddy. We're three to five years out on baits. We've got this plan. And, and you know, some of that is a is a soft launch, because when you come up with something amazing or if there's a, a category, right, mm -hmm. that can cause that to maneuver around if something becomes hot in the fishing world that you know you you fit that whether it's everybody's deep cranking now or needing yep. a jerk bait like this maverick or whatever um i, I know tell me a little bit about that yeah it, it is um it's a lot harder for us as rapala to do things that garage companies could do right where a guy could make a mold pretty quickly here in the u.s start pouring it and make an adjustment right or get something to market in i don't know let's call it six months just for the sake of that whereas we're dealing with you know you selling things into big box stores also dealing with independent retailers you know you kind of there's like a schedule on how all these places that you you know people that like to buy lures where you and i buy lures from well they kind of need that at a certain time right so we also need those things to come out roughly at a certain time which causes like you said it, it you know we're looking five years you could out miss a year you can miss a whole year. Yeah. So it's a year at least on a lot of lures. Uh, Maverick again was two years in the making. It actually, when we came around to the first cycle to have it released, like the go or no go, uh, it just wasn't ready yet. So we held it for another year, fine tuned everything, got it, you know, exactly the way we wanted it and then had it available for launch. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the elephant in the room here. Like people, sometimes we get comments on these things, which we love, but they're like, well, how come we didn't talk about this? And, you know, we don't film these on the day. Generally speaking, I think producer doodles, the only one we did like the day of was that uh, record smallmouth with my buddy. Cause we oh, yeah. to la yep. launched that up and then the, the cheaters, the cheaters, oh, yeah. but, but like people don't realize, like, I mean, we've been working on these things and, and some of the stuff, of course, that you're going to talk about. And, and we have to wait to launch this podcast because the stuff we're talking about while we're talking about it, the public doesn't know yet. Like this right. is, yeah, this is like, yeah, we had we had a, a hard set on the when this podcast could actually get launched, which is which is super cool. And I, I think people sometimes think, you know, today in the Amazon world, I call it right. Like you order it and like, what do you mean it took two days to get here? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's insane. Insane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you have do you have any idea on like what percentage of lures that you work on that are just like get scrapped rather because they don't work or doesn't fit? I would say the the process we have now, um, it would be a very low percentage that that don't get brought to market. It, generally, what it would be is more like, say we're looking at something to launch for twenty five, right? we already kind of know what that is. And, and as we would get into this fall, which is kind of when we would have to start getting more serious about, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down kind of thing. If either the market has changed or if we've found maybe some production issues or, or something that's going to hold us up and cause it to not succeed, then it's more our own doing to hold it and, you know, wait for it to come around another cycle versus just, dropping the project altogether. Um, at least, you know, from a Rapala US uh, standpoint, most most everything we do is pretty targeted and, you know, we got a pretty good idea on what we want to do so that we aren't wasting our time developing something that's not going to make it to the market. And, and, you know, this may get me in trouble. I don't know if you can even answer this, but those are the best ones. So, oh, yeah. I kind of learned a very long time ago, a buddy of mine, Jeff Simpson, worked for In Fisherman. Mm -hmm. He, you know, as a writer at the time, you know, and a 
younger writer at in that group at the time this was probably late 90s he designed the uh chubby darter did you know that i did Okay. Yeah. So, but my point is, is I kind of learned there, whatever that is, 20 some years ago, about 25 years ago, I guess that like, Hey, there's an outdoor writer and he sold that to, you know, company X, Y, Z. And then we also have another friend. You probably know he has sold four or five different lures to multiple different companies. Yep. You know, one to this guy, one to this guy. And does that happen a lot with Rapala still too? Or even if it's a basic concept? Um, Cause I haven't mm, heard of any getting, you know, no, no, most of, uh, we try not to work through that route. And like I said, some of it's because um, on a lot of it, we're looking at a more global scope too, right? So things we also want to, I don't know, bring to light. We also want Europe to like, and we want, you know, Asia Pacific, APAC. Um, we want that region to also bring it in, right? Cause then you just maximize your efficiency. Uh, if you're going to make a lure, you might as well have something that you can sell a lot of globally, which Rappel has been, you know, really good at doing. So this anyway. new Maverick jerkbait that you kind of like unofficially launched, like literally five seconds after we're allowed to talk about, it, we're going to drop this podcast. <laughs> so the Maverick jerkbait is this like naughty, naughty, like small mouth, not that other things don't like it, but that's all I care about as long as it ends in ass. So, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. I mean, is that going to be, you know, like in Europe and all the markets? Yeah. Yep. They even they'll, like a lot of times what you'll see um, globally, especially Rapala lures is different colors. Right. So some of the colors we have here in the U.S., Europe might say, eh, we don't need these five colors, but we'll add these five colors. Or, um, you know, there's there's a version that has only two hooks. Uh, due to some regulations over there. Uh, right. So two hooks instead of three and like six colors instead of the 18. Right. Yeah. I mean, you even see that with like Rapala Canada. Is there, yeah. it's not different, but it is different. And, mm -hmm. you know, I get some of the PDFs, you know, sent to me as a guy that works with you guys. And I, I click on some of those things and I'm like, man, what do they, what do they sell? They got nets over in <laughs> Asia? What? I feel gypped. Right. But, I mean, yeah. but some of that stuff is obviously it is targeted to the, the thing, just like you guys still do some of that here. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we're still even though it's a big company, you know, globally speaking, that'd be a huge net to cast where you could have every lure fit every market. Right. Even in the U.S., you can't have, you know, there's certain lures that are still regional. You know, guys will buy in Texas, uh, you know, whatever south of mason the southern bass market but guys up north may not be into it or walleye even right like you see a difference from great lakes to midwest uh you know dakota pothole region even to minnesota right there's differences within there so when you can align it's great but yeah there's a lot of uh i get a lot of texts from from guys saying like hey what's this uh you guys have a chatterbait thing in europe like well right. like, yeah they do because they don't have to worry about you know, getting sued and fined. <laughs> that's always, a, that's a good thing. Yeah. 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 So uh, I'm going to help get us back on track here a little bit. Cause I mean, we, you know, me and you are like, this is this, it's like a, uh, a symbolism show, ADD, ADC, <laughs> Absolutely. S L O W. <laughs> yes. Any rate. So but on the lure concepts, like bringing this back, because I know people like I don't know how many of my buddies have asked for this podcast without asking for this podcast, you know, because they just they always want to hear behind the scenes. They see me hiding stuff or got boxes mm -hmm. in my boat that I can't show them or putting things away. Um, we're going through that. So pick me back up to because I, I like I drug us off the tracks a little bit, too. Right. It happens. But, yeah, it does. That's that's what we do. But so you're back there. We're 3D printing. We're going through the process. We're trying stuff, right? You're going through. You finally kind of get this. And then you start making more of a um, a temporary mold, right? Yeah. So you can start figuring. Because, again, like I've worked with other manufacturers in the past with lure stuff. And it is crazy that, you know, when you use a different material, there's different buoyancy. And I don't know, again, how much of this, because I know you're there's so many people involved in this. It's different people's positions. But, you know, mm -hmm. the different materials so people understand, like when you have a cavity inside of a lure, the thing has to float. So you have to have right. a certain amount of buoyancy, assuming it's a plastic lure, not balsa. So... I mean, you, you can't just make it the size you want. You have to make sure that 
you can support the weight of the hooks and, and it doesn't, you know, maybe you want it to suspend like the Husky jerk perfectly suspends. If you put bigger hooks on it, people, it will sink a DHJ 12 fun fact, number five, <laughs> short shanks, uh, round bend. If you put a larger, they will sink in the bottom. Uh, promise you. So maybe you want that. Maybe you don't, but so all these little things that you got to figure out in that time process. And I know we kind of talked about, you know, there is no such thing as a real time process in this because mm-hmm. you're going to make it right or it's not going to go. Yep. Um, but b- bring me back, you know, because again, like you're, I don't know if we want to jump into some of the stuff you've already done in that awesome little machine shop. But when, when we get to that, we, hey, we're starting to make a mold. We go, hey, guys, we handed them off to a bunch of Rosses or Gerald's, one of those, all your pro staff guys. You guys have a, a top shelf pro staff. Yep. And these guys go, hey, this works, or this does this, or maybe we this doesn't work, or hey, we need different hooks on this thing. And that's the one cool thing, you know, we're doing with some stuff right now. But all I can say is, you know, we try even just a lot of different hook styles, sizes, and, and, and types, because it really makes a big difference um, on the hookups. Like me and you just yesterday, we were talking about like the DT series, like they have a certain hook for a very, very specific reason, because people generally what they're doing with that. Mm-hmm. And then you get into like a jerk bait or a top water, um, you know, I don't know how much we can, again, I'm going to probably say that too many times today, but I'm trying not to get fired here. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that I don't, I don't think a lot of anglers, even really good anglers, honestly think about the thought that goes into a lot of these things. Yeah. So we'll just, we'll take Maverick again, for example, just because it of new stuff we have, um, you know, th- that was really built from the ground up and, by that i mean the hook that red line finesse treble that number five that's on it was built for that jerk bait right vmc we didn't offer a hook that you know was that amount of gap that sh- that uh, shank length all that so that hook was designed for that bait those were specced, um yeah from our pros that was quinn talking to all of our pro staff asking them what hooks do you like using? What what do you not like about hooks on jerk baits? You know, what do you love? That kind of stuff. Which well, it, yeah, and again, a little behind the scenes for people listening to this that maybe they don't know. You know, we gotta always it's just like you fishing, right? You take things for granted and not know sure, everybody sure. knows it. Rapala is owned by, I guess you could say, or owns, or however you want to say it, they are partnered ownership with VMC, which makes yep. primarily hooks, terminal tackle, jigs, etc. And that's a huge advantage because Again, oh, yeah. not, not, I'm not knocking anybody, but like the premium, you know, jerk baits, I guess you could say. There's a handful that most of the top shelf bass guys are using and not just bass guys, even walleye guys. Yeah. And they, I'm just going to tell you because I have a lot of bass friends. I hate to say that out loud. You're not one of them. I can't but, believe you. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. obviously I'm not. <laughs> I mean, look at our Greg Gallagher podcast. If you haven't seen that, we're at 10 pound smallmouth. Make sure you go check that one out. But my point is, is these guys are taking a, a jerk bait that may cost at a much higher pr- price point than what this Maverick is going to be. And they're stripping the thing down because it's like, hey, the terminal on this is junk, you know, I, and right. they're putting all new hooks on because they know that the jerk bait's great, but the hooks suck and they're losing a lot of fish or they bend and break or roll the points or whatever. And so, uh, again, just I want to give a little background on that. And I'm, I'm that's a big advantage with Rappel with having a hook company and say, make us this hook. Right. So, you know, and for, for the Maverick jerk bait, then we have, so we get that hook from VMC. Well, the great thing about Finland, uh, our designers over there, our engineers, they are really good at making lures. So if we tell them we want a jerk bait like Maverick to weigh a half ounce, uh, like 15 grams ish, you know, for those in the metric. Oh, area. metric. Oh, yeah flip the script to talk over there um we want it to suspend at in 60 degree water we want it to suspend at a 45 degree angle that head down all that stuff they knock it out of the park finland knocks it out of the park uh right out the gate so you know your point about having a Is that computers that does that uh yeah they're basically robots no but i mean to i mean somebody's got to input that information into but is it computer programming or Oh, for the specs of like how we want all that? That's yeah, me. I mean, to make that bait, like, I mean, I would think that would take somebody like a life to learn, you know, just. No, nah, man, they, they're, uh, our guys over there are insanely talented. It was like a, it's basically like an email and a Teams call. And they're like, okay, two days later, boom. Like first 3D print is pretty much ballpark. So uh, they've been doing it long enough that uh, they got a pretty good idea, which saves us a lot of time. But yeah, back to your point of, 
you know, all that input that comes in on, on how it, um, you know, what guys are seeing when you start fishing it, because that's the big thing, right? You, you can look at a lure in the tank, but until you start putting it in real world situations of casting it throughout the day and, uh, you know, bouncing it off a rock or a dock or clipping it off your trolling motor head when you're trying to cast it, hitting a power pole in the back, right? Like you just don't really know durability. You don't really know, um, how the thing's going to perform. So that is a great point of us having the pro staff we do is when we get them out, when we get those prototypes out, we get a lot of feedback really quick, you know, yourself and, you know, our, our bass guys are on the water enough. It doesn't take two weeks to get good feedback, right? It's more or less a day of fishing or two or three, right? It's the only way because I'm just going to tell you straight up. It is crazy. I, I mean, whether you work for Rapala or not, like, I mean, let's be honest. You have other lures that aren't Rapala in your box. Like, I don't care. And then people are yeah. like, oh, my God. Uh, anybody that doesn't is lying. I mean, mm-hmm. a good a good company wouldn't say, you know, don't expect you to never have anything else or use because it's just not <laughs> practical. Like, right. you know, we don't talk about it. But I have an awful lot of different lures that I've used, you know, through the years, whether I was with a company or not. Mm-hmm. I got to catch fish under different circumstances. And it is crazy to me how many baits you put them in the water and they look amazing. And you're like, oh, my God, that I, I'd eat that thing. Well, fortunately, uh, the fish do not know that because how many times <laughs> like they just suck and they do not catch them. Yeah, and that's why I'm always amazed, like with the rapple. It's like I, I had a conversation with a guy the other day and he's like, well, what are you guys working on? I'm like, I like I can tell you. Right. Like, right. <laughs> I, this is literally a guy at the dock. And I said to him, I said, oh, yeah, I think you'll probably see some stuff, you know, down the road. That's just how this works. And and he was like, yeah. And he literally said, he goes, you don't see Rapala discontinuing lures like everybody else. And I thought about that. I was like, you don't. Like, there's a lot of companies, something's out for two or three years, and then all of a sudden it just disappears. And that's like, and now we have this. <laughs> right. Right. And it's like, oh, um, shad wrap, um, about 100 years old, uh, floating Rapala, about 150 years old. I mean, I don't know, but long time man been there a minute yeah yeah no it's uh again like between you know us in the u.s whether it's internally pro staff guys you know even over in finland like they're the same they're just a bunch of fish heads right those dudes just love catching stuff now it's different right they like catching xander giant perch like five pound yellow perch and huge pike mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, they they still go out fishing. So even while we're testing things over here, those dudes are just as about it as we are, uh, which I think helps, right? When you have that many people who love fishing and and know fishing that well, looking at a lure, I feel like it's a lot harder to have a miss uh, versus, you know, say it was just me and you, right? I'm making stuff in my garage and we're like, oh, I don't know, it's probably good. You send it out and maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I learned about Rapala probably, you guys, somebody could Google this and fact check me and then look it up. But I want to say it's a, it was mid to late 90s. I was traveling with Gary Roach, and that's when the Husky Jerks came out, was coming out. And he literally had like a dozen of them. They had numbers and everything on them. I may or may not have swiped a couple. <laughs> no, and you wouldn't have done I, that. I know. And I can remember just fishing those like three or four baits that I had, you know, it was like one of this color, one of this color. And I was like, and they were shallows of most of them. I think I had like one deep diver. And I just remember like at night, just in the fall going, just, I mean, I, I felt like I was cheating. And I was like, <laughs> what are they? I was like a little crack. Hey, 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 when can I get some more of them? <laughs> can I get more of those? <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. And it, to, you know, and and again, to me, that was kind of almost the bait that put the walleye market on on track, even though that may sound crazy, because that was one of the first really like plastic, because everybody thought of Rapala back then as a balsa only company, right? Sure. Shad wrap the original floater, the joints and all that stuff. But um, I don't know, maybe fill me in if I'm missing that there was a plastic bait that just took over because that husky jerk just took over on the Great Lakes for like 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're I think, uh, at least to my knowledge, nail on the head. Yeah, and that was a whole different bait. You know, that concept of it perfectly suspending at a reasonable price point. You know, it was kind of yep. a premium bait at a, a working man's price. But um, anyway, so when we get farther down into, like, the finishes and stuff, mm-hmm. it is that, you know, you got it. You go, you go through the molding. I guess maybe we jumped ahead a little bit. But you go through the, the, the short-term molding, say, 
we hope yep. this is the right. tooling. Yep. Right. And then we go into like you guys have your own tooling shop and you're going to make the final mold. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. For the most part, like basically everything Rapala does, even the machines that we use to, you know, bend our wires for our, our hook hangers and all that stuff, we make all those in house. So, like the whole manufacturing thing is pretty much Rapala from the get go. Um, so, yeah, once we get proto tooling and um, production tooling, generally not a lot of changes, right? Like once you get proto tooling dialed in, you just make it on a bigger scale so you can make more bodies at the same time. Or if it's a balsa, um, you make more of the, uh, there's basically templates that the lathe follows. They're, they're automatic lathes, but it's like an exaggerated shape of, uh, I wish I had something around here. Picture a DT body, right? If you want to make a DT 10, there's a certain body size. I can't remember what you extrapolate. That's if you're a carbon decoys, if anybody ever seen that. Yeah. Carbon of... decoys, same thing. So, um, but yeah, you go to production tooling. Well, okay, cool. You're making, you got the bait figured out, you know, lip size, you know, hook placement, you know, all the spec, uh, split ring size, you know, you know, what hooks are going on it, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta get them painted, right. Or finish somehow, whatever the cosmetics are going to be. And, uh, we got a team over there. Uh, Ace is the dude that kind of leads the charge, uh, who is phenomenal, uh, at stuff. You can, throw some colors at them and say, yeah, I mean, like, what if you did a little chartreuse, a little blue, and then like, you know, like some of that, uh, like a flip-flop, like a purple flip-flop color. And he'd be like, oh yeah, I could probably do that. And then sends you a picture and it's painted up and it looks phenomenal. Uh, so yeah, there's like two different departments while they're under product development, uh, like the paint team, the design team. Uh, they also, they kind of take over as the lure is coming towards production tooling right like proto tooling will make a bunch of bodies because they need a bunch of bodies to paint and to finalize that process because uh again we need we as rapala because of the volume we're we're working on lure wise from making like you can't garage paint stuff super easily right we have people sitting in a paint booth painting baits you know at the factory but there's still limitations because they're painting 50 at a time, right? Going down the road. Dude, that's a great point because when you look, I don't care if you buy a original floater in Walmart today Mm -hmm. and you have one from your dad's tackle box, like, yes, they've done very changes on on patterns and things through the years, but like, it's the same. I mean, it's like identical, man. Identical, identical. And and that's a good thing because that's, I can tell you not the case with, with, certain manufacturers you know you, yeah. you buy five and you look you think you got five different colors and it's just five different dudes painted it and decided they were going to do what they were going to do that day. <laughs> yeah no, right right no it's a it's very like there's a um you know a, a process and like a list right with pictures and descriptions and all that stuff on how to paint each color in the rapala lineup uh so that every painter whether they're if you're filling in you know at a different paint booth that day they know what they're painting and know how to reference it, uh, which is awesome. Which, on a random side note, uh, but I feel like I've brought it up, just the Rapala factory. The thing that blew my mind as a dude that grew up in Minnesota and, you know, was a Rapala fan from, you know, micro-sized. Uh, even when I worked uh, at FLW, our office was 10 minutes down the road from here. So I'd pop in every now and then, but I always kind of wondered how things work. But when I actually got to go to Finland last fall, and tour it around, it would blow your mind how many people put their hands on a Rapala lure. Plastic or balsa, doesn't matter. From start like, to finish. Start to finish, it's insane. Every, literally every step of the way, someone is hand handling that bait, whether it's cutting the lip slot in balsa for the, for the diving lip, uh, painting it, uh, finishing it, and then the whole, you know, hand tune, take tested, right? I mean, there's people we had, uh, I guess, on our social media uh, a few months ago, but you could see uh, some of the people running them through the tank. If they're off, they tune them, run them again until they're straight, and they hang them up. They dry for, I think, 24 hours before they get packaged to make sure there's no rusting or anything like that possibilities, and off they go to a retail store near you. 
again, not to hijack this again and take ADD people like me and you off the tracks, but <laughs> I'm, I know we're going to get asked. We might as well just say it. Sure. How do you properly say it? Is it Rapala or is it Rapala? Rapala. 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 Not Rapala. Not Rapala. Rapala. I don't even know that I heard in my time in Finland anyone even say something remotely close to Rapala. Rapala. That makes it easy because I'm thinking like yeah. rap. 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 Right. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and so, give me a little details because I know me and you getting just talking to you driving home from work or bouncing off some maybe projects that we were working on. May or may not be, sure. Can't we can't talk? I mean, you know, <laughs> but I'm very happy with things right now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, your Finland trip. I yeah. mean, that's gotta be like you kind of just said, like a kid in a candy store. Oh, it was, taking, it was hard to focus on working for sure. Yeah, but so take the fan out of that, if you will, because like I, that's one thing I don't get, and we both know I'm not going to say him, even though I'd like to. Bob, you know, I'm just kidding. But some some guy that like works in the fishing industry, we both know him. We know a lot of the same guys, and you're like, this guy doesn't even like fishing. Like he well, he wouldn't be excited to go on that tour or to go yeah. or that's not a tour to go through the facility. But yeah. I look at it as like a tour because I'm just so. I'm, I'm eating up with this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, like that trip, give me some highlights of that trip when you went to Finland and kind of explain that whole situation. Yeah. Some of it, uh, well, so we, we normally, it goes both ways, whether, um, PD guys from Finland come to the U S and then vice versa. So the fall works out pretty good for us because that's when we're getting ready to set lures. We're going to launch. Uh, so for example, this coming fall, of what, are, what year are we in 2023 that'll wow. be <laughs> yeah time but that'll be uh approving things that we will launch for 2025 for an idea of the right timeline you're working on so it gets a little confusing but again going over there from the whether it's approving paint samples or final check and action stuff just because they have well the resources in a the people and then b just all the fun tools, like anything production wise to make a lure or to paint a lure, they got it. So if we're there, it's way easier for me, like, you know, to sit with Asa, who I mentioned earlier, our, one of our paint guys and be like, that's a really cool color, but we need a little less silver flake in it or something. And then they can just paint it and then we can look at it again and go, Oh, I would think we could, we could annoy those guys pretty easily. Oh, yeah. But the thing is, they're ate up like they love it. More colors, the better or the more like critiques on stuff. Right. They don't really like those easy projects where you got to just say like, well, and, and you know, and here that's a good point, because, you know, Rappel for so many years was like you got a, I say a dozen colors. I don't know how many, but it was kind of the base stuff. Right. And now all yeah. of a sudden, like the Shad Raps, for example, I don't know how mm -hmm. many they have, but it used to be they had like maybe 15, a dozen. That was yeah. like. 40 or 50 and then you got exclusive I, I think it's 54 but i don't have a i thought i had a master catalog laying around here i don't anyway yeah. it's a lot it's a bunch and it's getting more and i see that too like with the storm lineup a lot of people don't realize like you guys own storm lures and storm you know that was that was kind of our upper midwest company you know it was a great lakes deal yeah. you know wiggle warts hot and tots all those things have been around damn near as long as we have and those started with like hundreds of colors because a lot of people probably don't know this and because i can tell you some of the captains specifically that they would say hey make me a color and and storm would do it they would make a charter cap and he'd have to buy 50 of them or 100 whatever that number right. was i think it was a i think it was a gross actually and then guess what when the charter captain comes back and goes yeah i'm gonna need two more gross of those my buddies in the marina and this and that well then all of a sudden storm's like yeah we're gonna go ahead and make that Let's a stop make color that. Yeah, <laughs> it was kind of like evil genius, you know, that they're using those guys and still selling lures to find mm -hmm. out instead of just somebody like me going, well, it'd be really neat if we did this. Well, everything's neat. And but when you put it right. in the water, sometimes it just doesn't work too good. Mm -hmm. So do you think, I mean, that the color process is that, that Rapala is kind of getting, you know, just more open minded? I mean, because they have more skews than they've ever had. So it can't be a skew thing. Yeah, I, I think some of it is like the some of it would probably be the market nowadays. Like I think people are more receptive to just, you know, trying new colors, I guess, uh, especially in those baits, uh, take a shad wrap. You introduce a new color that looks kind of like it would catch you a walleye. I'm probably going to buy it, you know, just 
just to see. Uh, but I think the other side of that is some of the people now in Finland, especially in the, um, you know, the color department are also a little younger and maybe have just grown up with watching the industry as a whole blossom with colors. I mean, do you know how many custom painters are within 50 miles of my house? A million. Um, I like probably two. Yeah. Two. There's 2 million people living there. There's 1.5 <laughs> million custom painters. Every but other like, person is a painter. Yeah. I mean, like fish USA that I work with, you know, I sit down and you know, we meetings with those guys and they're like, Hey, what's the number one selling color? And you know, Husky jerk. And they're like clear or Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, 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 I see what, oh, I see what's going on here. Uh-huh. I see what you're doing y'all. Mm-hmm. And, and in fairness, cause I know I've had conversations internally, you know, with my people there and they're like, Hey, just because this works on the Western base of the Lake Erie for three weeks, really good. Doesn't mean we can make a lure and sell it across the country or quite literally the globe. And so it's practical now that at least you guys are offering that and making it easier for people that, that think they got this, you know, the new greatest thing or just want to make their own tweak that there's no way you guys could do. Well, it's kind of cool too, because like our, you know, our custom color lineup, I think also has helped shine light just on custom painters in general, because there's a lot of people, really good anglers. I felt like for a long time knew where either you had a buddy that painted stuff or, you know, you knew a guy or you drive past a dude shop, you know, on the way to the lake cabin, whatever it was. And maybe you'd get some stuff painted or maybe you'd stop in and and buy something, order something online. But now that you can see like in a store, right, you can walk into a Shields or whatever, Bass Pro insert big box store here. And like see colors that aren't the norm, custom kind of colors. I think it has people also looking back the other direction uh, at custom painters. And I, I feel like I've seen more of them uh, growing up in the Midwest, you know, in recent years, just because it seems like the market uh, is into it. You know, people like it. People love colors. I love color. I'm a, oh, you can make new colors in like any crankbait. Doesn't matter brand, whether it's Rapala, whomever. And I'd yeah. probably buy it because I'd be like, that color looks pretty good. I think I should. It's adult trick or treating. Half of them you didn't put in the water because you're. Yeah. You're... <laughs> so, you know, along with that process, again, I mean, we're joking and, and teasing, but we're, that's what we have to do here. You know, I'm working on some stuff with you guys that I'm super excited about. Yep. And I'm always amazed at like how people are in touch or not in touch with things. And, you know, guys in your office there, it's amazed that they know like what's happening in my back door. Right. On what I would call an intimate, I don't even know how, I I guess the way things are now, people just figure stuff out, but stuff that's not on social media stuff that I'm like, Oh, the heck did you guys know that? Right. And, and, you know, and that helps keep uh, uh, in touch with what's really going on and what the demand or what could be, but Mm -hmm. like how, how much, I mean, immediately I think of like Odd Defoe, okay, with the, sure. the OG, is it, Balsa Lure, mm-hmm. right? How much does pros like myself, because I came to you and asked for some very specific things, and yep. I think you guys, it wasn't like you didn't know that there was some, maybe some opportunity with, with some segments. That's about as, as uh, I feel like I'm on the stand. Your Honor, I cannot yeah. say any more than uh, that. I plead the fifth. Yeah. But so like Ott's deal, does he just come in and say, hey, man, I carve baits. I've got this thing that's just killer. I don't want to make them one at a time. I want you to send me a big old box of these things all finished up with a rattle of splash on them. Like, yeah, probably. So you're right. Ott, um, Ott is like the anomaly from a pro staff designing lure standpoint, because I would say even before I was working at Rapala, right. And I was covering bass tournaments and you'd talk to guys that uh, maybe were coming out with a, bait that had their name on it and sometimes they didn't even know it existed (laughs) didn't really know a whole lot about it yeah uh so it's not not every just because you're a professional angler doesn't mean that you're really good at product development there you could be a really good angler you might not be good at product development yeah there's there's a lot of yes men out there right yeah absolutely there (laughs) it's like it's it really does blow my mind how many people in the industry are, are good anglers but couldn't really give you the nitty gritty as to why a certain lure is good. Right. Whereas Ott, growing up where he did East Tennessee, like that's the thing, man, you either carve lures, crankbaits yourself, square bills, um, you know, uh, flat sided crankbaits, 
uh, like a lot of the OG, OG Slim, Tiny. Uh, you know, now we have Rocco, uh, Square Bill. Like, but Ott made all that stuff anyway. And he made it all because he didn't think there was anything better out there. So then one day I was like, yo, what if you guys do something like this? You know, I've been carving them out of balsa. Here's what I like. How so about this one, <laughs> honestly, it was like I carved it slim, sent it to Finland and Finland was like, yeah, okay, we can do that. And it was simplest, probably start to finish Rapala PD in history because I, you know, he did it. He already did the legwork. Yeah. Yeah. And then Finland was like, Oh, okay. We just got to replicate that at a, like you said, at a mass quantity. And I would make them for, uh, you know, guys in the around his house, he'd sell them to other pros or give them to guys or whatever. And uh, oh, hey, it's my boss. Hey, Charlie. Sorry. You want to say hi to Ross? Hey, Ross. How you Charlie doing? Davis, everyone. Oh, no. Are We're you... just, no, I'm just telling them how great. You're not filming like a live show right now. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. You're you're 100% live. Of yeah. yeah, that's yeah. exactly what we're doing. Yep. Yeah. So we, we, we know we need to put Kyle on at least a 30 second delay, no matter what. <laughs> Yeah, plus I've been fighting this lighting, so this is great. I was gonna say, well, it's so heat. hot in here. Yeah, it's super, yeah. super nice and warm. Yeah. Live action, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Live action. Now I got the freaking sun moved more. I mean, for crying out loud. Uh, anywho, golly. Producer dude earning his money money right now with this with this cut in. With this no. edit, yeah. yeah. Yeah, edit, producer dude, no. Ott is the man is basically where I'm going with it. So, uh, yeah, he's like a product development guy's dream is a guy like Ott Defoe who already understands a lot of the intricacies of a bait, right, because he's been making them for so long. Well, there's not a lot of guys, you know, on his level, especially with a crankbait. So, again, we're shooting this a little ahead, but we're going to launch this right at iCast. And long story short, We've got the Maverick jerkbait, which is kind of like the ultimate bass. But I'm just going to tell you, hint, hint, it works for walleyes, too. I bet it does. Um, it's kind of a premium jerkbait, right? And it's yeah. already won. I mean, I, I, I think we'll talk about some of this in a hot minute, but it's already won how many tournaments? I mean, Jacob Wheeler won. Yeah, he won the MLF. It was the team championship. Um, so that was back in December. Uh, that was on a prototype tool version. Uh, so it worked pretty good. And then, yeah, it's got a handful of top tens already on the elite series and in like triple a competition as well. So, um, I, they eat it, uh, which is good, right? That's a, it's a good thing when you come out with a new lure and it gets that level of success and that kind of feedback where guys want to throw it. I'll be the so first we, to admit, there's been a lot of stuff that Rappel has come out with over the years that our pro staff has kind of been like, eh. Yeah, I could do without it. Mm, yeah. Okay. And, and it happens, right? Like, so it, just when you focus in and, and like I said, with the amount of uh, intel we got from our collective pro staff on this, you know, it, it makes sense that it's been so well received uh, through them. And then also, like I said, in tournament finishes, right? If you have the confidence to use a lure, you know, these guys are good enough that uh, like I always joke with Wheeler, like, Okay, you tell you tell me this about bait X, Y, or Z, but at the end of the day, you could just put like a Cheeto on your hook, and you'd probably still catch fish because you're Wheeler. You know what I mean? You're sometimes, Ross Robertson. You could troll a hot dog and catch one, right? Sometimes, sometimes not, right? <laughs> but I, I mean, here, so here's a fun fact that I was told, and I don't even know if you would know to correct this or not, but the number one skew at Rapala with all your stuff is actually the jig and wrap. Selling numbers. Ooh, uh, I'm trying to think back to, let's see, last year number. I mean, it would, yeah. I know at one point it was, again, maybe that was a year or two ago, but the, the point is, is it's like, it's up there. And you think of that as a ice fishing lure. Right. But like Troy Linder, buddy of mine that, you know, works with you guys, uh, mm -hmm. Al's son, he's out in California, you know, for many years fishing that in the super clean waters, you know, basically video gaming before video yeah. gaming, before it was technically live sonar, you're using yep. a traditional 2D. Um, obviously his dad, Al, breaking that thing out, ripping it into, you know, not so clear water, you know, inland lakes. It works on the Great Lakes. It's won a ton of stuff. Guys have been using it forever. I can actually remember uh, old Chief there. Uh, on the PWT, he won a Detroit River event, like in 
if it wasn't the late 90s, as early 2000s, using a jigging wrap in the Detroit River, where you typically would lose 4,000 jigs a day. Yeah, that'd, and, be, you know, that'd be an insane thing to do. <laughs> and he did, and he won, and, you know, yada, yada. But so we've got coming out, because when I say now, it's it's this stuff is that's being talked about in July here is actually being released technically in the fall or spring, depending yep. on, the, on the individual item. So yep. it's like you can't go run out and buy this tomorrow. Um, but things are getting kind of amped up. But there's a new where I was leading in there is the jigging wrap. Like, oh, I use them. Well, I use them a lot. Jigging wrap magnum you're speaking of. Oh, yeah. We can finally talk about this. I've had to be hush hush because I might have seen things way before I was even supposed to. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a uh, jigging wrap magnum is a cool. Uh, I don't want to say like an evolution of the jigging wrap. But, you know, last year we had jigging shadow wrap, right? The number nine size. Thinner That's profile, long. lighter weight, so it's got a little more hang time, uh, and, hang time and it, it found a niche. You know, like people started using it. It was accepted that it wasn't a jigging wrap. It didn't have the fall rate of a jigging wrap, but yet here's situations that it excels. And a lot of times, you know, shallower water early in the year, maybe even later in the year when fish uh, are up shallower, a jigging wrap still works, but may not be the best option. So that's kind of where jigging shadow fell in. Chicken wrap magnum was kind of to your point about like uh you know troy catching bass on it and a lot of southern guys have low-key been using jig wraps over the years especially wintertime stuff um you know you get those huge balls of shad out over the the river channel down towards the dam um even like mouses secondary creeks and stuff like that and you just drop jig wrap down and catch those fish on 2d well yeah now with forward facing sonar uh guys are a lot better at catching those fish but you still need the tool to do it. And uh, we actually, we had a, a flat jig was a thing we came out with a few years ago. It was actually a European, it was an ROW uh, lure, rest of world um, that we brought in and worked really well. The problem is because it weighed, it was like an ounce and three eighths, I think is what, how much it weighed. That's like predator overseas, a little big for us, maybe. Yeah, but it was basically, um, it fell really fast and really straight, which was good for that open water stuff or vertical fishing. Uh, the problem was the tail fin fell off a lot. You know, there were some durability issues with it, uh, but it was really good. And the <laughs> the funny thing is it kind of caught on in the bass world right as we discontinued it, So, <laughs> which makes sense. Uh, so we said, all right, we obviously got to make, you know, a better mousetrap. So yeah, Jigging Wrap Magnum, um, it basically, we, we knew the weight, it's an ounce and an eighth is how much it weighs, uh, but we upsized the tail hook on it and we upsized the treble hook on the belly. Uh, so it's a number seven size, but it weighs an ounce and an eighth. A um, little wider, wow. it falls real vertical. And uh, the thing about flat jig compared to a jig and wrap, jig and wrap, you know, you have that uh, traditional jig and wrap swimming action. Flat jig would return to center quicker than a jig and wrap would. So we wanted that in uh, Jig and Wrap Magnum. And Cody Huff is one of our pros. Uh, Cody grew up in the Ozarks, Southern Missouri. Like that's what those guys do in the winter is use a Jig and Wrap. Number seven, number nine, Jig and Wrap. Those are like open water blue ice and, and silver are like the only two colors you need. Uh, flat Jig was his favorite thing because it had that faster return to center. You could trigger those fish, right? They wouldn't get as good a look at it because it keep moving faster. Uh, so in this process, you know, kind of back to the prototype and thing, when I sent him the first samples of it, I was on the phone with him. The dude literally dropped it down 30 feet and hopped it once and said, ah, it doesn't turn quick enough. I'm sorry. What? It it doesn't. He's like, no, it's not, it's not. A, uh, yeah. Could you give, could you give it 30, 30 more seconds? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, do you want to jig it again? Maybe you want to jig it five more times. Uh, so it was awesome having his input, but we basically took some things with it. You know, like a jig and wrap works really well, but the nose hook and the tail hook are kind of small depending on your situation, which can be a good thing because maybe you get hung up less in, in certain bottom um, content, but also from a hooking fish, especially, you know, a, a five pound large mouth or a five pound small mouth that you might run into, um, they could toss the hook. The number nine jig and wrap, that's a lot of lead. Seven eighths of an ounce, that's a lot of lead flailing around. Uh, so by upsizing the hooks, you know, we were able, you get better hookup ratios. We also added a swivel to that belly, uh, which is super cool. 
And uh, so now no more leverage. Uh, you know, we do a double split ring on Jig and Shadow Wrap. Uh, jig and Wrap, you know, obviously I've seen guys mod them uh, different ways to to accomplish that. But why? That's a good, I know, I don't expect you have the answer for this, but why? Because like on my regular jigging wraps that I use for ice fishing, like fives mm-hmm. and sevens and whatever, I always upsize the hook to a little bit better VMC one, um, yep. a little higher end, and but also to a bigger size or two or three sizes in some cases. Right. But what what do you think is the reason? Is it just because of wear and hanging up that they don't do that out of the gate? Yes. Yeah, because you can't get to tangle more um, by upsizing the hook, depending on how aggressively you're snapping the thing, right? But yeah, just less risk like it still works still gets the job done uh but again from a because the jigging wrap obviously huge in the u.s but that thing catches fish globally so it buying it off the shelf in you know whatever norway the thing works just as good for what they're doing with it you know as we are over here and then yeah if you want to buy another treble hook different treble hook to upsize on it no big deal but jigging wrap magnum we kind of wanted to offer premium finishes by having that it's actually a plastic outer over the lead. Yeah, that's kind of it's so we could get more premium finishes than just painting lead, obviously. Uh so you get so things they, that look they, a lot better and it's more durable because then your fin is part of the body, right? Instead of an like inserted an fin. Do what? It's like an M M&M. and M. Well it's like yeah. It's yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, for sure. For yeah, sure. I know I looked I looked some of those and I'm like, man, how does this like I'm always just amazed. It's like that on the, um, is it the BX minnow? Mm-hmm. That's got it's balsa, balsa, balsa it's, core, but yeah, plastic outer. Yeah, those don't work for walleyes, guys. Don't use them. Never, no. never use one ever. No, no don't. No, <laughs> no, they're not. No, don't. Um, yeah, different. Interesting. Well, mm-hmm. hmm. I'm, uh, I don't know. I'm always intrigued by that. But I mean, you guys outside of that, even like, I mean, with Wheeler. Obviously, you guys have done a lot of stuff. I mean, the plastics is the big one. Like, because yeah. Adam Rasmussen, you know, he won a tournament. Jacob won a tournament on, yeah, Crush City. Who yeah. came up with that name? That was actually um, Quinn and I were kind of spitballing around, like, just terminology you'd use if you called your buddy, you know, and we're talking about how good of a day on the water you had. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Usually, if I call Dan and I'm telling him about, my day on the water, like, dude, I crushed them. Or I would normally say you sucked, but yeah, I'm here <laughs> right. I didn't catch any fish, but I had fun. I took a sunset picture. It was nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was kind of that. And then it morphed into like, you know, crush city is just it, like, it's a place that every angler wants to be regardless of species, right? It doesn't matter. Saltwater, freshwater, you could be catfishing, you could be carp fishing, bluegill fishing, you want to be in crush city because that means you're having a really good day on the water. So that's kind of where that stemmed from. Um, and like globally speaking too, right? Like we made sure in all our Rapala offices, like it, it clicked, everyone understood what it meant. Right. So right now there's, I don't know. I've seen what is there six, seven or eight baits in that currently? Well, yeah, there's five shapes, but two sizes of the swim bait, the mayor. So long story short, the Crush City is going to be a Rapala soft plastics brand. Yep. Yep. Right. And so Adam and Jacob both won on the same lure, right? Uh, yeah. Adam also won the cleanup craw. Uh, he, was, he was flipping that around a little too. But yeah, the freeloader is our kind of straight tailed, uh, I guess, like fluke-esque, but not, you know, it's narrower. Um, it's four and a quarter inches. Yeah, it's a bad little dude. And it's funny because that was designed as a chatterbait trailer, a vibrating jig trailer. It was kind of the first thing that that Wheeler knew he wanted this to do. Uh, but along the way, it was like, man, I could probably put this on a jig head and like swim it around, or I could Demiki rig with it or mope, whatever you want to call it, wherever you're from. Uh, it just kind of, the more we played with it, we changed the body. It started out a lot more round than it is now. It got a lot flatter and narrower so that you could get more body rock uh, when you put it on a straight jig head, like the way Jake uh, won on Gunnersville. Um, but yeah, Adam was throwing it on a, on a, I'm pretty sure it was a jackhammer if I had to guess vibrating jig, but um, yeah, pretty sweet that uh, those dudes are 
crushing them already on it. And we've had, again, a handful of other top tens. There's even maybe been some guys that aren't Rapala guys that have done well on them because they bummed them from Wheeler, maybe. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, it's 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 been a pretty uh, pretty fun thing. And that whole like, because this whole plastics idea was several years in the making, right? Like Rapala didn't just say, all right, screw it. Let's do soft plastics. Trigger X, right? Years ago was a, you know, toe dip in the pool of soft plastics, if you will. Um, you know, and, and for people too, like, uh, again, we, maybe we can talk about the actual materials because I've been using some of the Largo shads mm-hmm. and that's naughty. So, I mean, there are different brands that guys use and because at times a soft, if you guys are into this, you may know if you, maybe you don't, you don't, but some of these really soft swim baits or plastics seem to get more bites in certain circumstances. The problem is, is you get like one fish out of them or maybe the color right. options aren't there and like on um, um because i haven't used as much as that crush city stuff out or um plastic set because what's going on and they're not really generally speaking walleye stuff although there's a couple in there that are got my name on it <laughs> right. um, but, those, but those largo sheds there's something different in the plastic where it's super soft they got some good colors uh, even like that live perch looking one, like that's yeah. straight body or that silk chartreuse is I, I just straight jacked them on that thing. Yep. Um, even just put them on a, on a jig head and a back, like a moon eye or whatever, or a sleek, but um, even the back of a, a hair jig, like the VMC hair oh, jigs, yeah. those, those are really good, but they just, they're way more durable, which is a big deal because I think, you know, I know some people are like, Oh, it's cause you didn't, you know, go to you know Walmart and buy these things, whatever. I'm like, no, I'd go to fish USA, of course. But aside Obviously. from that, <laughs> You you don't want to carry like when you get on a really great smallmouth bite where where I live, forget money even which we can't because these things are expensive. Right, you are going to save a ton because you don't have to. You can have more variety because you don't have to carry five hundred of something because you get one fish out of, uh, you know, a traditional swim bait that's awesome. But yet, yeah, you literally get one fish and they rip it apart. Right. Yeah, yeah. That was so, a, that was a huge deal for this. Was was balancing that line of durability, but getting action, right? Like Largo shad is a really good swim bait, but three inch Largo shad, for example, uh, at slow speeds, not so great, but that's because of the material it's made out of, right? That, that type of plastic it's made out of. So when we went into this project, it was like, we know we got to have the right action at the right speed, but we know it can't be something that you catch two fish on and got to put a new one because that's just the worst thing on the planet. You know, people love it cause you're catching fish, but man, it's annoying uh, when you got to keep putting new plastics on. So I think we, I think we did a pretty good job of that. And that was kind of this whole crush city soft plastic thing. You know, we went to Wheeler partnered with him. This was all his brainchild. So most, well, I say most, all these designs we have and, you know, moving ahead, looking ahead, um, it's all from whatever goes on up here in his mind that he regurgitates out into an email or in a meeting in notes or uh, a lot of these like the our cleanup craw and our bronco bug are two shapes that I mean, he was like gluing stuff together, right? Taking existing things that work and basically Frankenstein them together to say like, this is my ultimate craw. This is my ultimate uh, bug. I want this thicker. You know, the body needs to be thicker. I want less plastic here. I want more plastic here. It's uh, it, that was really cool. You know, from the PD standpoint of like watch getting in a dude's wheelhouse. That was it with Wheeler. I don't think I'd want to be in one of those meetings with Ike and Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> like, he, I mean, he makes me look tame, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Sometimes yeah, you can get a little squirrely, though. Yeah, I, I expect. What else do we have coming down the pipe here that we can talk about? Because we've got some new baits that are obviously getting launched here. Um, I think two two other ones uh, in this new launch. First off would be Shad Rap Elite. Uh, we have the 55 and the 75. These are the Elite concept isn't new, right? We have Countdown Elite uh, that we introduced last Action. year. Oh, boy. Slipping away, picking up a few. This is if, if people watch the podcast. Ooh, look what! Ooh, 
Ooh, Ooh. I might might have been pulling some of these. Got them a little while ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, those are um, those are kind of cool. It's really uh, that that idea, that concept of the elite family came from um, APAC uh, Asia, where they you know whether they throw a lot of stuff inshore saltwater, like a lot of bank fishing, but they're catching really mean, angry fish. Australia, same thing. Uh, would they're be, among them. Yeah, so they're taking balsa lures. Uh, but they're tearing them up. Like they catch a lot of fish on shad wrap, but your hook hanger can pull out, right? Like I've had it happen a bunch. You catch a pike trolling it, right? You get the thing, whether you go to net it or not, or he's got the back hook just in his, you know, beak and he starts flailing around and pulls the hook hanger out and now your shad wraps toes. So this is a wire through construction. Well, wire through in the body. It obviously doesn't go into the swimming lip because physically it can't uh, work that way, but it's a, it's a pressed hook hanger, so it's way stronger. Uh, we actually upgraded the hooks on this thing too, uh, which are sticky sharp. They actually, uh, the hook itself is kind of a, um, oh, I would say like a pretty close kissing cousin to our Redline Finesse treble. Uh, so it's not PTFE coated, but the hook point on it is insane. And uh, yeah, it's a, the colors on them also, I think, seal the deal. Uh, the biggest takeaway, though, is people hear shad wrap and you think shad wrap action. Well, because this one has a lot more going on inside in terms of hardware, uh, right, that wire through, it's it's a thicker wire. So you need more balsa to fit it. So it's a little wider than a shad wrap, which means that action's a little different. Um, but it's still a fish catching son of a gun. And the thing I really like is you can cast them a lot better on a bait caster. Uh, so even the 55, right. The, the smaller size, uh, that we came out with, you can launch that thing on a bait casting setup. So, uh, whether you're a shore fisherman in the Dakotas that you want to cast one around, you know, early in the year or in the fall, uh, bass guys too, right. Again, shad wrap's been low key bass thing forever, but the problem is you yeah. can never cast them or you had to use yeah, a spinning rod use it on spinning rods. And then bass you guys are, them. Oh no, I can't use it on a spinning rod, but yeah. So. That's the cool thing about uh, Shad Wrap Elite. And then probably the other one would be Ripping Blade. Sounds real straightforward. You know, it's a blade bait, but it's got tungsten in it. Um, and it's a ABS, a plastic uh, shell where the, the tungsten's uh, concealed. So, you know, our body length, uh, while the, the metal frame itself has weight, most of it is in those tungsten balls. So you get a more stable action, I guess, you know, in terms of a blade bait. Um, and again, some really cool finishes on. Fun fact, I got some samples of those mm -hmm. maybe three, four months ago. And yep. um, first cast, hooked up. I was like, I'm kind of excited because <laughs> the, col the colors I got, honestly, were like clean water, like yep. Bassy, yep. Uh, uh, green carp stuff. And <laughs> I, I didn't just happen to get some of what I would call walleye colors or especially off-colored spring colors. So yeah, that's right. kind of exciting because in, in my neck of the woods, blade baits are hot. Like, I don't think it's a secret. Um, I know Fish USA just sells a ton of blade baits and it's a lot of different brands. I, I'm excited to see, yeah. you know, yeah, some, some Rapala stuff in there. So yeah, outside of that, I mean, really it's, Plastics obviously are a really big deal. We're we're real excited about that. But the rest of um, really the rest of our lineup is pretty solid. And it's been a just an absolute gross amount of work to, to get it to you know where people can see it at iCast and and you know buy it this coming fall. So, so what would be the other thing? Rather, I mean, I'm almost more of a personal question. Like working with with Rapala from what you do and seeing things behind the scenes and all that. What has been the biggest eye opener with lure development or production or just you know the things that you're kind of like, man, I never would have guessed that. Yeah, I mean, it probably, it really, honestly, I think the the first thing that struck me was just how far in advance you're planning ahead for lures right so right now summer of 23 we're working on 25 but we already have 26 fairly sketched out and ready to go now not that there aren't projects that could come up uh you know that we've been r and Ding kind of on the side that you could plug into those timelines but like just how maybe a walleye bait maybe a walleye bait maybe uh but 
yeah, like that, that was just to me again, the casual observer was like, Oh yeah, you see a new lure come out. You're like, Oh, they drew that thing up in the spring. I could buy it this fall. Bada bing, bada boom. Here we go. But yeah, the, the scope that you got to look at, um, is pretty wild. And also like, yeah, I mean, there's some production limitations for stuff, but like I said, Finland, like those dudes are so good at what they do that, you know, more or less, if you can dream it, they're like, what I, what I have learned the Finnish way of, of doing things is like, Oh no, we can't do that. It's impossible. And then like two weeks later, they'll send you samples and it's like exactly what you were talking about. And you're like, okay, yeah, we did it. So well, you just I, set the bar kind of low. I get it. Well, I, I do that on a daily basis. I don't want to give you a compliment, but like me and you were talking the other day, we were both driving home from working and, um, you know, we were talking about hooks for like an hour yeah, because of maybe some of the baits that we're working on right now. And, and that thought process, or even like you said earlier, the ability to have your own hook company and make something or bring something back that used to be OEM from 10 years ago, but, you know, maybe doesn't fit because again, some of these things aren't walleye focused or whatever, or, yep. you know, just again, working with the pro staff guys. And that's, what's great is some of the people, when I talk to them and tell them things they're like, man, I know this to be the case on this. And, and they actually listen. There's definitely a different level of organization and planning with you guys compared to other people that I've, you know, know that work with other companies or that I've maybe experienced for sure. But um, well, very we, cool. We appreciate I, it. I think it's, it's very easy to see why Rapala is definitely uh, the creme de la creme and lead, leading the pack. But is there anything else that you just would feel guilty if you didn't leave us with some just bright information? Because I know neither one of us are that smart, obviously. But not, I mean, honestly, I don't know. Uh, again, I feel like our ADHD, we could – Sit well, here and just go down some wormholes of all kinds. We could go forever, but there's this curse. Producer dude, if you're even awake yet. Um, Wait, have we what, ever, what? 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah have, we <laughs> ever asked, have we ever asked a guest, like the closing thing, like say whatever you want, give us your like your uh, Dalai Lama, you know, <laughs> you know, statement, and they always go, uh. Yeah. <laughs> like every time. Like that every just time. means you covered everything that needed to be covered. That we did that's half, half full. Producer dudes half full. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. We're like a functioning family team of ding dongs. Look at us. Look at us. I, in all seriousness, I'm really excited because I appreciate the the level of intensity and the, and the desire to just make things work. And again, I, I'm I'm not trying to tease, but kind of obviously, I, I get people all the time that I don't think they understand. They're like, "Oh, well, I'm one of your clients. You can't tell me. You can't show me." Like, guys, it doesn't really work. That he won't show me either. How many times do I go show 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 me what you did? He's like, I can't show it. Can't yeah, he's a video it. guy. He, he, you got to remember, he he used to be my TV producer, and so he's like. I'm like, well, we aren't doing extra, man. He's like, oh, it'll, it'll be fine. Let's just put this out there. Like, you know, he's he's got that TV mindset. We he always he, he always positions himself so you can't <laughs> see when he unhooks. He's, he's a pro. <laughs> hey, so, I, again, I don't know if you, you – serious funny thing, but you get these people and these we're doing a lot of YouTube stuff now, right, putting mm -hmm. these videos out. Day in the lay, we got me, just me and producer dude go out there a lot, and we shoot these things, and people are like – why do you keep turning your back to the camera? Show me the lure. What the hell? Ugh. And I'm like, dude. And I'm like, I, I understand to a certain point, but at some point, you can't be like a caveman with this and not understand. Like, I literally would be fired. We have to go. It, it's and what people don't understand is, is it's not me trying to be crazy. Like, I don't bring it up like I am joking now, but not joking because we have some badass shit coming, guys. But it's they don't understand it's like we have to go use this like we talked about earlier like do you want us to have a lure that just doesn't really work good and you go spend your hard-earned money on this thing or do you want something that like we fail with and we change 10 times and make it right and maybe this yep. bait comes out a year later than what we wanted to wink wink hint hint in order to have this thing dialed in and so yeah i have to turn my back because we're out there using it when it's just me and producer dude but yet we can't sh you know what i mean like i don't think yeah. i don't I don't see how people don't really get that, but they don't seem to, or they just want the Amazon. I want to see it now today. Deal. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. It's just kind of where people are nowadays. And, and uh, I think it is kind of lost at how much effort. Cause you know, even now, I, you know, I'll meet my wife's whatever, you know, friends, their husbands. And they're like, Oh, what do you do for work? I'm like, Oh, I'm a product manager for Apple. And they're like, Oh, like the lures. Like, yeah, you know, you work on lures or whatever and, you know, make some stuff and help. And they're like, 
well, so you just go fishing all the time? And you're like, well, yeah, kind of. But also there's like a lot of thought that goes into this kind of stuff. Like what size split ring are we going to put on? Because that can change uh, when that jerk bait suspends or, or how, what running depth you're getting on a crankbait, right? Like little tiny things that people just assume you slap on a bait and you're good to go. Uh, those are the things that keep you up at night. I think that, well, it does you because you're good at it and you like it, but I think there's still a certain percentage of the population, hence producer dude, that just thinks they're like, we're drinking a beer with a cane pole and straw hat in the head of like a river, right? Like Huck Finn stuff or something. Is that accurate? I'm I'm just out here having fun. Yeah, that's exactly it. We need to get you in a straw hat next time. (laughs) I I have a Sim straw hat, 100%. because you. Oh, yeah. It's a sweet one, too. Yeah, you've got to cover up this beauty, baby. You know, this ginger, I, I will actually spontaneously combust if I'm in the sun for more than 45 seconds. Yep, that's a fun I believe fact. it. I, yeah, I have to. I, mean, the, the, I was out guiding today in this shirt, and it's, you know, we gotta we got to cover up. Another advantage of watching on the on YouTube to see all this stuff. But, well, I can tell you, I, I we are definitely going to do one of these again. And yeah, we're not, yeah, I'm not, not going to tease as to tell you when, but we have some really cool stuff in the works. Don't ask me, people. Don't ask me the timeline. I don't think we even know the timeline because we're working through all kinds of stuff to make these things dialed in. But the- No, but I do have some stuff to send you probably two weeks. Yeah. When people are watching this, we are literally, but when we launch this, we literally will be in a meeting in Florida with the whole team. Mm-hmm. And and I'm I'm like super excited. We've got some of my other partners involved in this, and it's just like it's honestly it's if if it doesn't excite you that you're you're not doing the right stuff. Like for sure, not. for sure. I mean, even this partnership. I don't know if you know me and Dan. We we talked for years. In yes. Order, I mean, it was almost a joke. Like I would walk by him at a trade show, and I'd be like, "How you doing? How about now?" But to get <laughs> things, you know, where they're in the yeah. right place, and and everybody, and whether it's there, there's many different things that have to come together, whether it's a lure or a relationship. A lot of moving pieces. Yep. Yes. But, well, we are, and the next time we do this, because um, I don't like you that much, is, it's a joke, but I really like your dad. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite dad clients. So. <laughs> you know, this is, I am really impressed that you, you had me on here, and we have spoken as much as we have on the phone, because I thought the couple days my dad and I spent the boat with you a few years ago, um, I thought that ruined it for life. Like I thought I'd never be allowed to speak to you again. Uh, mostly because we weren't catching walleyes for a while. Uh, well, sh- we, don't say we, that. We, we weren't. Okay. Excuse, let, let's, you were losing fish. We were running a three-way rig and you lost so many fish. I thought you were a PETA member. Well, they were drums. So I was shaking them off. No, dude. Yeah. They big were drums, walleyes. So I was getting rid of big them. walleyes. And I just wanted a small mouth. That's all I wanted. I was raiding your the boat. Whole day. All, all you guys comment below, please. Please comment below. What what would you think that I would do or what do you think I should do? Because it's bad. The <laughs> walleye slayer, you know, TC, whatever it is, Twin City walleyes, you know, deal. And his son's like, can you catch a bass? What's that guy doing over there? It was. Oh, I felt like there was a four-year-old in the boat. And then he kept oh, losing oh, giants. Oh, reel this in. Oh. We did catch some nice ones, though. Oh my God. It was painful. It it was, it was fun, but yeah, it was a, it was a fun couple of days. Your dad is a hoot. At any rate, the next time we do this, we've got Kyle Wood from Rapala. We've learned that it is Rapala and it's not Rapala. Now you can say it however you want. Uh, As long as you buy them. Yep. You call it whatever you want. You You don't call me late for dinner, but (laughs) we're going to have you on again when we are launching some of the stuff that we are working on now, because as kind of one of the, the themes of this talk was, Yep. It doesn't happen overnight. It's like ketchup. Good things come to those who wait. Exactly. Mm. exactly. So with that said, I want to thank all you guys for tuning into the Big Water Podcast. Hopefully, especially you guys that made it to the end here. Uh, Kyle, thank you for your time. Producer Dude, they can come see us at BigWaterFishing.com. They can yes. see us at Big Water Fishing on Instagram, yes. Facebook. Yes. We're on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon, yes. Yes. Google. Yes. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. Mm, I, it, mm, listen, get it, if, get it. Get if it. there's a di- yeah, rap, pu, la. If there is a digital platform for the podcast, we are pretty much on it. And if we're not, screw them. But here's the deal: it's even free. Is this amazing? I feel like this is a value, dude. That's the best deal I've heard of. <laughs> Bigwaterfishing.com. That's what we're doing. Catching big wallies. So appreciate you guys subscribing, liking, comment, and talking on all that good stuff. Until the next episode, Ross, producer, dude, and Kyle, we are out. <laughs> <laughs>